Hello, I'm Justin Briley, back with an experimental new beard, as you can see, and welcoming you to a classic replay edition of Unbelievable, in which Dr. Michael Ward talks with Laura Miller about her journey as a sceptic in Narnia. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more conversations that matter, or listen via our weekly podcast. Subscribe to the Unbelievable newsletter and you'll never miss a thing, and we'll even send you a free ebook featuring my conversations with thinkers like Jordan Peterson, Richard Dawkins, Paula Gooder, and Tim Keller. The link is in the description. Enjoy the show. Well, hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Justin Briley. This is Unbelievable, the program that brings you conversations that matter every weekend here on Premier Christian Radio. And of course, you can find these weekly dialogues and debates via our podcast too and over at the video channel as well. And uh, you may have come today expecting the first of our shows on race and the church as announced last week. Well, unfortunately, having to postpone that a little bit longer due to some scheduling issues, but we will bring you those shows in August. So today I'm pulling something else out of the classic replay bag in fact reaching right back to 2009 for a show i really enjoyed hosting on a skeptic's journey in narnia now of course what we couldn't do back in 2009 was access things like the newsletter app and video channel so just a reminder that if you sign up to our newsletter you won't miss a thing plus you'll get a free ebook featuring some of my favorite conversations with people like jordan peterson richard dawkins tim keller and others so links to that newsletter at premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable and if you'd like to support the show we've a special gift for you all the video sessions from our usa conference featuring christian thinker john lennox who of course joined us on last week's show so if you'd like to support the show with a gift and receive those videos exclusively from that conference just follow the links from the show page premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable and so to today's classic replay all the way back from 2009 as michael ward and laura miller join me to journey through the wardrobe you're listening to unbelievable with justin Briley. Really fascinating one for you today. I don't know if as a child you ever felt the back of your wardrobe to see whether there might be a magical land hidden behind the coats or clothes that were in it. I certainly did because I loved the Narnia stories as a child. They were read to me by my father and um, I've gone on to enjoy them as an adult as well. And of course, recently there's been the film adaptations and all sorts. Well, we're going to be looking at the Narnia stories in some depth this afternoon. Um, This is the show where Christians and non-Christians talk, and we have a Christian and a non-Christian joining me today on the program. Laura Miller is our non-Christian, and uh, you'll get a sense of what she's uh, talking about when I say her book is called The Magician's Book, and subtitled A Skeptic's Adventures in Narnia. Our other guest is uh, Michael Ward, and Michael, you may have uh, come across recently, uh, he featured on a BBC documentary that looked at uh, a new um, radical sort of re-understanding of the Narnia stories, or at least a hidden depth to them, um, and that was called uh, The Narnia Code. His book that it was based on is Planet Narnia, and um, we'll be finding out what exactly he discovered about the Narnia stories. Uh, Michael is a Christian, and um, we're going to be examining at some length as well the Christian, if you like, uh, symbolism in the Narnia stories and how both our guests on the program today have interacted with those and and felt uh, differently sort of uh, affected by them. Well, let's start with you, Laura. Thank you for joining us. You're coming to us on the line from New York, I believe. Is that right? That's right. Fantastic. Um, Well, thanks for making the time. Um, Tell me, though, uh, you grew up really with Narnia as a pretty big influence on your life didn't you yes the book um the first book uh, I'm part of the 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 old school that believes that the first book is the lion the witch and the wardrobe (laughs) um (laughs) the first book was given to me by my second grade teacher when I was seven years old and um it completely changed my life and um I you know I probably read that one at least 20 times and most of the rest of them almost as many and um and really it 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 made me into a different person which is one of the reasons why i wanted to to write this book about narnia it turned me into one of those 
children that goes to the library and checks out the maximum number of books every week and is back there again as soon as soon as, uh, as soon as I've been through all seven of them. I remember that was how many you could check out from my local library. That's, that's what an avid reader I was. Mm. Um, and, and that has stayed with me through my whole life. Um, I had a rocky history with the books because I was raised as a Catholic, but I did not perceive the Christian symbolism in the Narnia books until I was about 13 years old and someone clued me into it. And I had had a a negative enough experience with my Catholic upbringing that this really put me off of, of, of Narnia for many years until I returned to them because I had been given this assignment as a writer. I became a literary critic. My assignment was to write about a book that changed my life. And I had thought about all sorts of you know, sort of more conventionally literary books to pick that had a big influence on me as an adult. But realistically, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was the book that changed my life because it really did make a reader out of me, and and, and my life as a reader has really shaped the, the whole rest of my life. We will go into more detail, but you describe the feeling of discovering the Christian motifs in the Narnia stories as, as being cheated what, why was that, just briefly? Well, to me, Narnia was this place that, that was so wonderful. I, for, you know, as long as I could, I tried to believe that it really existed and that these books were... Uh, one of the, the people that I interviewed was the writer Neil Gaiman, and, and he describes reading them as a child and being convinced that this was a real place, and these books were reports from a real place, and he would be damned if, if he was going to believe otherwise. And I think I felt the same way myself for um, as long as I could, until I finally, you know, c- kind of reconciled myself to the fact that it probably wasn't really real. But it, at the very least, it was a kind of private world of my own, and I... I I didn't really enjoy my earlier in, my early encounters with religion and and um and I felt that it was I felt betrayed I felt tricked partly because I felt stupid because I hadn't perceived the um the similarities which are of course obvious once they're pointed out to you I I felt stupid because I had been deceived and then I I also felt bad because to me Narnia represented an alternative to the world that I lived in and Christianity was part of that world to me and I I it 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 seemed almost as if I had been cheated I had been mm. given this this alternative that turned out to be just more of the same old thing Really interesting, and, and we'll, we'll talk in more depth about that um, as we continue. Let me introduce our other guest, though, uh, Michael Ward. Michael, thank you for being with me on the programme today. Great to have you here in the studio. Thanks, Austin. Um, so, Michael, you also you started a love affair with Narnia from a similarly early age mm. to Laura. Um, what was the background to that, though? Um, because you, you certainly were quite familiar with the Christian theme in it, from an early age, I think, weren't you? Yeah, my f- first exposure to the Narnia books came when my mother read them to me and my two brothers. Each Saturday or Sunday morning, we would jump into our parents' bed for a chapter before the day began. And um, and then when I was a bit older, I began to read them for myself. And my parents did a, you know, did a, a, a sensitive job of, of bringing out some of the Christian aspects of the story without turning them into kind of you know just cryptic crossword clues that needed Mm. to be deciphered um but you know i i knew enough at that early age of seven or eight or whatever age i was to to know that aslan was a bit like jesus that was kind of the level of it and i liked that because i thought oh these books have got a second layer layer of meaning and that made them a bit special as far as i was concerned As you say, um, and as you said, Laura, you know, once it's pointed out or you've come across it for yourself, the the Christian aspect of the stories are fairly obvious. Um, Though even saying that, I think there are still a lot of people probably around who just have come across the Narnia stories as a child and and are actually fairly unfamiliar with the the Christian theme. So maybe for us, that's all too obvious now. But but I think for many people, even that that very simple level of meaning is is something possibly still to be discovered. Mm. But but you have recently michael discovered what you say is actually an even 
richer seam of meaning, which has actually gone completely unnoticed up till this point. So tell us very briefly about that. Yeah, well, I think it, it's the um, the Christian level. I mean, the, I'm not. I shouldn't say the Christian level because what I'm about to say is also Christian. But the, this biblical layer of meaning, you know, there are parallels between Aslan and Jesus. If if you look at that, it doesn't actually play out very coherently across the series. Three of the books seem to be quite biblical. You get a creation story in The Magician's Nephew. You get a gospel story in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And you get a, a Last Judgment story in The Last Battle. But then you look at the other four books, and there don't seem to be so many very obvious biblical elements to those stories. And Aslan, although he's still quite Christ-like, he's not doing anything very, very obviously uh, that Christ did. He's not. You know, there's no kind of Narnian Pentecost or Narnian Ascension or Narnian Nativity. Mm. Uh, so, so scholars have asked themselves, what what's going on here? Is this just uh, you know kind of not very thorough writing, or is there a, a third layer of significance? And people have suggested th- all sorts of theories, like the seven deadly sins or the seven sacraments or any other seven they can think of, really. Seven being quite a common number in religious yeah, writing. That's right, yeah. Um, so there are lots of things to, to draw on, lots of ideas that people have come up with, but none of them have really persuaded anybody. And the one seven that is all over Lewis's work, namely the seven heavens, the seven planets of the old um, Ptolemaic cosmos, um, that that seven has been overlooked. And it uh, was something I stumbled across when I was halfway through my PhD on Lewis. And I wasn't looking for it. I, I just fell upon it one night. And um, it kind of... that <laughs> It's interesting how Laura says, reading The Magician's Nephew, um, reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has cha- changed her life. This discovery that I made six years ago has changed my life. Mm. Um, nearly all the work I've done since February 2003 has been about <laughs> Lewis and the Seven Heavens. Well, and I'm sure it changed your PhD a fair bit as <laughs> yeah, well when you discovered that. But fascinating stuff. And you, you uncovered basically, yes, this parallel that Lewis has drawn in all the books. In fact, the, the books really are subdued, imbued with mm. the um, imagery relating to one of these seven planets mm. that repre- uh, represented in the seven heavens mm. of, of the medieval literature that he was a, was a professor of. Mm. Fascinating stuff, and we'll hopefully be able to draw that out a little bit more. But obviously, the, the most obvious level on which people do interact with uh, a level of meaning in the books is, has always been the, this, this, as you say, fairly plain biblical Mm. Um, sort of level um, and and obviously that was the one that Laura found such a stumbling block when she did um, realize it and we'll be talking about that in in the course of the program Laura Miller um, loved the Narnia books as a child in fact she says that the Narnia books were really the books that changed her life they made a reader of her they made her fall in love with literature it was only later as a teenager as a, a more adult if you like that she uh, twigged the religious themes in the books and that came as a shock she says she felt betrayed cheated even um we're finding out from laura exactly why that was the case uh why she had that kind of reaction to the books and how she now views them uh also with us in the studio michael ward he's a christian um has never had a problem obviously with the religious aspect of the narnia books and we'll we'll hear his responses as laura and he have a discussion together so laura coming back to you um I mean, you, you do very well in the book, the, the Magician's Book, where you explain your sort of journey, um, giving us a sense of just what it was that the Narnia books meant to you. It, it was almost like um, the feeling they gave you was, was quite unique. And you compare it to um, a particular passage. I think it's in The Dawn Treader when Lucy comes across um, a magician's book and hence the title of your book, where... She reads the story, but almost as soon as she's finished, she can't really remember it, but she can only remember the feeling it gives her. And you you sort of say that's almost the way you felt about the Narnia books. Yes. I mean, one of the things I I wanted to to write about was the connection between how we read as a child and what a lot of people remember as this total immersion and complete... um, uh, you know, faith really in the story with the way that we read as adults after we've learned um, skepticism and we've, you know, developed the practice of comparing one kind of story to another to see what the different patterns look like, which which is the adult way of reading. 
and um, and and to try to find some kind of connective tissue between the two because I think that for many people that I know at least there's a, a, a great divide between those two experiences and and many people that I've met feel very sad about that you know it bothers them that they don't read with that um, that same level of belief and 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 submersion that that they had as a child, I, I didn't want to just bemoan that transition because I, I feel that we all need to learn to read with a certain amount of skepticism. Otherwise, we're just a sucker for, for any writer who can come along, and not all writers have the best of motives. Um, so I wanted to take the sort of skepticism that I had learned to apply to Narnia and to sort of go through it, to to work with the idea that that if it might be disillusioning to know a little bit more about the story you believe in, you might actually find a way through by knowing as much as possible about the story that you once believed in, and um, to sort of come out the other end with a different kind of belief. But when you did discover the, you know, it was made apparent that there was the, this Christian uh, story going on that, that the, the Narnia stories are based on, your reaction was to feel almost like that wonderful experience had been marred in some way, was it? Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted it to be something different from everything else in my world. You know, I wanted it to be uh, a, a way out of the world that I was in, in the same way that, that the wardrobe is a way out of um, the everyday life for the, uh, for the children in the Narnia books. And so... To me, I think I, one of the things I compared it to is that that famous episode of The Twilight Zone where um, where the guy is trying to get out of a cell and he spends the whole thing, the whole episode trying to get out of the cell only to wind up realizing that he's in an even bigger cell. Mm. So um, so that, has, that is how it felt to me. Um, you know, I, my feelings obviously changed over over the years, and and one of the things that I wanted to do with this book was simply write about all of the things that I still loved about the Narnia books that 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 hadn't been um, sort of taken away from me by the i by the idea that it was all religious symbolism. Because I, I, like Michael, I find that there's a lot of other imagery in the books that that still speaks to me and that is very beautiful to me. And so I, 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 I wanted to write this book as a sort of a combination of memoir and literary criticism and biography that explored how our relationship to a favorite book will change over the course of our lives, how what we see in it as a child may not appeal to us as a teenager or as an adult, but that other different things. Might mm. appeal to us. Mm. I mean, the experience you had then of of changing in your relationship to the book. I mean, it's slightly as as I think you've alluded to, tied into effectively what was for you a negative experience of of Christianity. Um, I mean, tell us a little bit about what that was, and do you think the reaction would have been different had had you had a more positive sort of um, Christian uh, influence on your life? Well, I think there are, t- are there are two. F- Factors. I mean, I, I wouldn't make my early Christian upbringing out to be sort of, you know, a, com- a terrible miscarriage of religious education. I was raised as a Catholic, but not as a particularly strict or, or gloomy Catholic. I, I, my family went to a fairly liberal-minded um, Californian Catholic church, and I went to catechism, which is what we call Sunday school, mm. once a week for quite a while as a child. Um, to me, it, it felt like a, 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 a system of, of rules that often seemed arbitrary and, and full of, you know, peculiar loopholes and, and, um, and, and uh, contradictions and, and, and that sort of thing. It, it, it it never really appealed to my imagination, the, the, the religion. And I never was really, I never experienced any sort of strong religious feelings. It was just something that I had to do um, once a week go to church and once a week go to catechism. And it was kind of a, a, a dreary um, obligation that my mother made me do. And so it, to me, it was actually, it was far less interesting than real school. And, um, 
and so to me it was a it was a tedious thing and um and something that I was constantly resisting and as I got older of course I I I encountered other forms of 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 Christianity and I met Christians whom I liked and respected um, not that I didn't like or respect the Christians that I knew, but it went as a child, but it just was completely unappealing mm. to me. So, uh, and, um, and I whereas, suppose it really grated the idea that all along Lewis had, had really been meaning this. This was the real thing that, that yes, Narnia was about. Yes. He was he was trying, I, I think, to describe the way I felt, say he's trying to trick me back into this very um, um, unrewarding uninspiring um, system of thought that the adults in my childhood had constantly been trying to indoctrinate me into. And and, and instead of being my ally, he turned out to be their ally. Mm, <laughs> and, mm. um, and, and, and this made me very angry with him. But of course, you know, when you get older, you're not you know, nobody can make you go to Sunday school or church anymore, and you have more freedom to choose what you actually want to believe in and or, or learn about. And I, I'm, I don't doubt that, that that is one of the reasons why I was able to return to the books and say, well, you know, I don't have to look at it as simply the delivery system for these Christian messages um, and I can also look at these Christian messages and see good things about them without actually believing in the Christian religion. And, and that enabled me to appreciate all of the things about Narnia that p- perhaps had appealed to me as a child, or perhaps I had entirely missed as a child, and, it, and, and enjoy them once more. It, it's really interesting, and, and um, perhaps we could bring Michael in at this point. Um, and, and I should say from the outset, um, feel free to, to just talk to each other don't feel mm. that it has to go by me but but michael just to get us started off there what's your reaction to to laura's experience and and i mean can you understand her feeling this sense of um loss and betrayal almost uh, when she did discover the, the christian motifs in in the books well my own experience was so different that it, it is a bit hard for me to to you know share laura's perspective or, or really even to understand it because um my own experience was that um, I also was brought up in a Christian home, an Anglican parish church was where my parents attended. And I I had a very good experience of church life, um, you know, religious practice. I, I wasn't particularly troubled by, um, you know, legalism or loopholes or contradictions. Um, that didn't seem to me to be the essence of the faith that my family was was engaged in it was you know it was a faith of of you know love and grace and mercy and all those <laughs> nice nice things and yeah um si- you know sin and forgiveness but the, the important thing about sin was that <laughs> once you'd repented of it you would be forgiven um so knowing that there was a christian element going along in the narnia books too just chimed with my experience that there, there was no kind of um, uh, mismatch uh, the, the two seem to reinforce each other if you like and what 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 I'm just a little bit confused about in Laura's uh, experience is, is why Laura you why why didn't you um, why didn't you conclude Christianity is like Narnia rather than <laughs> Narnia is just a delivery system for the, 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 the unfortunate kind of Christianity that I'd been exposed to in earlier years can well, I've of, I've often been asked that, and I think that um, that uh, you know, partly again, it was my investment in the idea of Narnia as an as as a sort of escape to a, a better world. Um, but I think also, I, you know, this is this is what I. This is what I think the the sort of difficult um, the node of the difficulty of of this, of, of this conversation is is that um, I don't think I ever re- really was a believer. I don't, didn't have the constitution of a believer. And while I can look at Narnia now, I, I mean now I see many um, fine things about Christianity, and I can look at Narnia now and I can say, uh, you know, this is a this is a you know, a good value or, uh, you know, a lovely idea, I don't actually, um, you know, I don't 
really believe in God, and so that's that's the that's the that's the rub, you know. I, I mean, it, 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 maybe it would be nice if it was true. Although I have to admit, I've never been particularly tempted to believe that it was that it was true the way that Lewis was. Mm-hmm. But I think my my childhood experience was kind of like Lewis's in that he was sort of put off by the church because it didn't appeal to his imagination, and um, and and he was in love with a sort of. Uh, Norse mythology and classical mythology, and you know when he in his in, in his youthful atheism, those things were the aesthetics of them spoke to him so deeply. I mean, he experienced art, literature, aesthetic things um, with this intensity that you know we would associate with religion. But I think that part of him always um, kind of longed to believe and. Eventually, he found a way to reconcile the fact that his aesthetics were with these pagan mythologies. You know, his his aesthetic tastes, which were so huge to him, they were so overpowering to him that he often spoke of things that he read about in books as if they were real things in the world. Um, you know, he he eventually found a way to um, to reconcile that with the Christian faith that that he wanted to believe in. So you and feel Tolkien was very helpful for, for him in you, that. You making, think, in some sense, he was predisposed then to 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 bring his his love of literature and aesthetics and everything into a, a kind of a format that would reflect a Christian faith. And for you, you you find yourself in a similar situation, perhaps, where you've got this love of literature, etc., but you've never felt in any way compelled to to then bring that into a something that is reflective of somehow of christian faith um yes i never felt the desire to um to believe to have a religion or to 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 have a relationship with a personal god that i think was really the motivating factor i mean lewis would describe his conversion experience as a sort of a rational process that he needed to get to it by reason but in a way he just needed to find a way to get his reason out of the way so that he could believe because he had this great yearning in him to believe in this thing and and tolkien and and their friend owen barfield helped him do this by helping him reconceive all of these mythologies as another face of christianity of, of the of the Christian reality, and um, and that was kind of the thing that kind of helped him there. But I have never been motivated by that desire, and so to me, I, I mean, I think that's why Michael and I have had such different early experiences of Christianity. To me, my Christian education, which I don't want to sort of demonize, because mm. it's, it's, I'm sure it was very nice in its way, <laughs> it just never spoke to a desire in me to believe. And so, to me, so I experienced it mostly as these strange rules about whether you could eat on the morning that you were having communion, mm. or you know um, whether baptized babies went to hell or limbo or whatever. Um, you know, all of these things were what I focused on because it wasn't really speaking to an emotional need in me. You're listening to Unbelievable. We're airing a few classic replays over the summer and today's is from 2009. Michael Ward and Laura Miller as a sceptic journeys through Narnia. We'll be back shortly. What I want to invite Roger to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness? It's too much like us. It's it's too they much like, like putting it like <laughs> yes, like the Greek views of the gods in some sense. They were like, like too much like but us. They were finite <laughs> and contingent. Here we're talking about a metaphysically necessary source. I admire this noble aspiration to find the highest possible ideal. It's almost as if you're proposing a new religion to meet this new challenge. It's not a new religion. Yes. What it is is something that sits in the same place. Mm. It addresses some of the same needs, but it is not founded on the same principle. If the New Testament says that Jesus did X, Y, and Z, did he do it or not? I don't think it's a story that's made by committee. Am I going to have a later literary genius who comes up with a great story like this? Or am I going to say, no, Jesus is the genius, and somehow that story has basically been preserved?
You're listening to Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Welcome back. This is Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley today airing a classic replay with C.S. Lewis scholar Michael Ward and Laura Miller, author of The Magician's Book, A Skeptic's Adventures in Narnia. And they're continuing their conversation on whether the Narnia stories convey the true potency of Christianity. Yeah, it's just interesting. So you, 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 me- you mentioned that it was Lewis's whole kind of purpose at one level in writing the Narnia books, to um, to strip Christianity of, of what he called its stained glass and Sunday school associations and yeah. make it appear for its first time, maybe, in its real potency. Um, so, I mean, my question, I suppose, is still, um, I mean, when you found yourself so attracted to Narnia, were you, do you think, being attracted by the real potency of Christianity um, or, or not? I mean... I'm not saying that you should have been, I'm just asking the question. I think that in, in, in a way, you're right. You know, what, um, you know, what was speaking to me was the, 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 the whole, I mean, I, I see Christianity as a cultural thing, um, and, and so what, what was being spoken of to me in those books was the whole body of Western culture, which is something that I really, really love, even if I don't actually believe in it's God. And so, um, so yes, I mean, Lewis was sort of able to muster all of these elements, including all of the, the incredibly rich uh, uh, a cultural imagery associated with the planets that, that you talk about in your book, into this seemingly really simple fairy tale narrative. And so mm. I was responding to things like fawns. I mean, the, the, the fawns were to me, the fawns and the centaurs were to me like one of the best things about these books, which obviously they don't have anything to do with um, Judeo-Christian religion. They're, they're, they're a classical myth, but that was my first introduction to classical mythology. Mm. Mm. And that just blew my mind. I loved that so much, and that led me to... Um, you know, read, you know, Bullfinch's mythology and the Dolaire's books of Greek myths. And and in turn, this kind of led me on this path to discovering Western culture, which is, um, you know, a, a, a great thing. And I think that the, the, the values that, that Lewis was espousing in, in Narnia, um, in the Narnia books, were, for the most part, I mean, there, there are definitely real problems mm. there for me with them. But, but, you know values of of being part of the group of of um of you know not uh of kind of humility of 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 perseverance of sacrifice um, that sort of thing yeah, sacrifice. i mean i mean he 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 lewis might have said well quite and and these these virtues for me are found in in god in christ and and so for for, for me uh, and again this is a purely personal way of looking at it i i found when i did discover the the christian element to the narnia stories it it resonated brilliantly because i i did ha- i do have a relationship if you like with jesus with i i have an understanding of god that that the narnia stories just perfectly kind of chime with and and so when i read of aslan and and the way he is and you know he's not a tame lion you know that that classic line which for me just sort of says something in within me that sounds to me like Jesus. It sounds like God. Uh, uh, do Do you ever feel like maybe you 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 are missing the fullness of what it feels like to to be a Christian who knows what Narnia is about and and to to read the character of Jesus in Aslan and to read yourself into Edmund and all those sorts of things. Well, I I suppose it probably would seem that way way to you. Um, because you are a believer, uh, and that is is that is the difficulty of 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 the or the limits of the the empathy that we're the the experiment in empathy that we're we're trying here. Um, obviously, the way that I 
understood Christianity when I was 13 years old is not the same way that I understand it now. I have a much um, deeper and more varied understanding of what Christianity is. I've met other kinds of Christians, both um, impressive and, and, and kind of scary. Um, you know, I've read The Divine Comedy. I've read Paradise Lost. I've read The Fairy Queen. Um, I've had all of these other literary experiences with, with Christian belief um, in the same way that I've read The Odyssey and... Um, and um, the Iliad and other manifestations of, of, of mythology like Ovid's Metamorphosis and and a metaphor, Metamorphoses and um, and you know been swept away by all of those narratives. Um, so I, I understand that my childhood experience of Christianity is not does not define what Christianity is. My my book was merely explaining why I happened to have that particular reaction, but I, but I think that that what I mentioned before in terms of why that didn't turn into a conversion experience, why didn't why didn't I say? I think what you're asking me is why didn't I say when I realized that uh, that that there were that there was this Christian symbolism in, in Narnia. Why didn't I realize? Oh, Christianity is different from what I understood it to be. Maybe I should give it another shot. And the reason why I didn't do that is partly because I was an inflexible, uh, you know, pre-adolescent. <laughs> but but through the rest of my life, you know, I I have had other encounters with Christianity, and what I have not felt is that desire to believe that I think is really essential in being a believer. I mean, I, 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 I don't think that you need to believe in the Christian faith to appreciate mm. the moral vision of, um, of the, that Lewis presents. In, well, and I, I don't... I'm sure you'd agree with that, yeah, Michael, I agree with you? that totally. And in fact, um, having read your book, Laura, uh, I, I think that it is probably the best book on Narnia that I have read. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I mean, obviously, accepting my own. <laughs> but, yeah, of but, but, you know, I've, I've read pretty much everything that's been written on Narnia. And so often, the books that are written on Narnia are written by Christians who are basically just kind of treating Lewis as their champion and treating the Narnia books as, as Sunday school kind of allegories that need to be decoded. They don't come to the books with any kind of mythological or literary awareness or of the kind of the subtlety of what Lewis was up to. Um, and I think that in some ways they, their perspective is, is so Christian that they, <laughs> that it, kind of works to their own detriment and that it is actually in your case at any rate your, your skepticism is is fresh and honest and um acknowledged and yet you're, you're still aware that the books gave you a great deal um and too too many of the the non-christians who have written on narnia just take the equal and opposite tack to the christians that they just use they come at the Narnia books with a bludgeon and a sledgehammer and a sl slash and burn. <laughs> they just hate ever. They go they go nuclear in their hostility to what Lewis is up to. And I think you've you've trod an excellent middle path. And I, I must say, I really enjoyed your book. I, I think it's 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 really enlightening and and. I would recommend it to everybody who's who's interested in Lewis and Narnia. And as would I, actually, um, I, because I have to admit, as much as I have enjoyed reading Lewis, I haven't read that much literature around Lewis. So, so for me, a lot of what you said was was really interesting, new to me about Lewis himself, about the influences on the Narnia books, and and that can all be appreciated without obviously having to be a Christian or, or not. Um, um, we're just drawing sort of to the end of this section of the program, and perhaps it would be good in a sense, to touch upon at least in the next program, uh, the next section of the program, some of those problems that, that did emerge for you um, and probably the kind of problems that you're talking about, Michael, when people have gone nuclear mm -hmm. on Narnia yeah. and sort of bludgeoned it because they say it's... Well, just to give an example, you know, some people uh, uh, talk about there, there being aspects of racism perhaps in, in some of the Narnia stories about... Um, a particular sort of misogynistic view of women, perhaps we'll we'll, we'll get into that maybe and, and uh, see see tease that out a bit. But um, in any case, what can't be denied, I think, what you're saying ultimately, Laura, is that, that although you had this, as you call it, rocky relationship with Narnia, you did eventually come round to to seeing that actually 
even as not being a believer, there was still an awful lot that you could get out of Narnia um, because because you feel it's obviously such a a good book in the first place. It, it, to me, it is it is great. The, these books are great literature for all that they might have certain kinds of flaws or infelicities, and um, it, and really, you know, I, literature for me is has something of the same role that perhaps religion might have for other people. Although I don't, I, you know, not to the full extent, and. And to me, I just wanted to make an argument for being a grown-up, for for recognizing that things don't have to be the perfect answer to all of your needs to actually offer you so much. Um, there can be flaws in a in in a work of literature, and yet it can still be profoundly meaningful to the the people who love it. Mm. Well, um, you're listening to Unbelievable. We're looking at Narnia, C.S. Lewis, and. Um, what it means uh, in terms of its its Christian uh, content and, and how Laura Miller, who is the author of The Magician's Book, came, um, reacted to that as a sceptical teenager and um, how her journey has taken her back to Narnia um, more recently. Uh, also with me, Michael Ward, the author of Planet Narnia. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Well, we continue our discussion one which uh, has a lot of personal uh, relevance as we talk about the Narnia stories. Um, Here's my little personal story. I I actually, my claim to fame is that I acted the character of Douglas Gresham in a stage play of Shadowlands. (laughs) And so, (laughs) unlike many children who have experienced Narnia, I actually did get to go through the wardrobe (laughs) and pick the apple and put it under my sick mother's pillow. That doesn't feature in the film, but in the stage play, there is this sort of scene where where Douglas sort of, there's a kind of, you know, scene where where that happens. And um, so that's my claim to fame. I have actually been through the wardrobe. Um, There was nothing there. It was just an empty backstage, but never mind. Um, But Laura, um, you wanted to go to Narnia as a child. It was so real almost for you that you you know you 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 didn't want to let it go in in that way um but but it did you say it it had these good aspects to it you talk to some extent in in your book about um the kind of values that you see is very valuable um that that lewis brings out in in various ways in some of the stories that, that crop up in the narnia books but you do devote a couple of chapters to some of the difficulties that come for you um, appear in the Narnia books. Um, for instance, um, you say there's a kind of possibly what you might describe as a latent racism in some of the descriptions of the uh, the foreigners, as it were, to Narnia. Um, so to give yes, us, yes, I noticed that you're carefully avoiding saying the word Callerman because <laughs> nobody knows exactly how it's supposed to I be. I know pronounced. that was exactly what it was. I was like. <laughs> Kalomin, Kalomin. <laughs> I yeah. know, and it's spelled different ways at different times. It's pretty inconsistent. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, there are there are racial stereotypes. I don't think that the books are devoted to reviling, um, you know, Turks or Arabs or whoever, uh, or Muslims or whoever the, they're supposed to be. They, it's just kind of a, a somewhat lazy reliance on a certain sort of cultural stereotype. And there are interesting permutations to that in that, in that, you know, they're very, very cruel, and Lewis had a kind of ambivalent relationship towards sort of cruelty and dominance. You know, he was sort of, he hated them, but he was also sort of attracted to them. And, um, you know, he could be very kind and gentle, but he could also be a bit of a bully. And, um, you know, I think it was a, a kind of a problematic um, uh, a concept to him hmm. that, that kind of came out by, you know, you displace all of the, the I mean, one of the, 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 the unconscious mechanisms of, of sort of racism is that you displace all of the personal traits that, you, you know, the parts of yourself you don't feel good about onto these others. But, you know, I, I mean, the word racism itself is so explosive, you know, people just completely associate it with uh, lynch mobs and bashers and that kind of thing, that it's very charged to even raise it. Um, nevertheless, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I can't deny, just in the same way that T.S. Eliot was an anti-Semite, there were racist um, aspects to uh, Lewis's personality. That doesn't mean that he had absolutely nothing worthwhile to say, and, and you know, I, I want to demonize him. I think it's true of 
you know, almost any writer, Western writer before the 20th century, that there are going to be elements of um, racial stereotyping and therefore racism in their work. Um, and I think rather than, I mean, there's this tendency with our favorite writers to just absolutely deny that there could be any, you know, sort of ideologically uh, bad things about them, um, whether the, that arises from sort of uh, some psychological mechanism or from um, just ignorance, which is, I think, probably part, mostly the case with, with Lewis. Um, you know, I think we just need to say yes. It's there, and and we have to be aware of it because if you, if you deny it, then it has a tendency to kind of sneak in under the door. But that's not the end of the story. That's not all there is, and we can sort of regret that and 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 move on to other things. Do do you accept that yourself, um, Michael? That that there is a sort of you know so, some slightly more regrettable aspects let's yeah. say of, of the way lewis represents the uh, the calomines in in the stories yeah i mean i think um laura puts it in a very reasonable fashion that every writer is a product of his own culture and time and you know social mores and there's no there's no denying that lewis was a um you know a a, a bachelor don for most of his life and was a Victorian. I mean, he was born in 1898, and he had virtually no exposure to people of different pigmentation. I mean, nearly all the the mass immigration into Britain that occurred in the 1950s and 60s, you know, passed Lewis by. He, mm. he lived in a very monocultural um, society in in uh, academic Oxford. So, um, yeah, most of his understanding of people of different colours and cultures was mediated to him through through literature. Mm. Um, and as um, Laura suggests, there, there are certain stereotypes, Sar Saracen kind of Moorish stereotypes that he draws upon. But um, having said that, I, I, I don't want to kind of sell the past too cheaply, I think. You know, there are quite a lot of things that can be said in Lewis's defense in the way that he depicts the Calamines. Can I just mention two? Go ahead. What, one is that, um, you know, this, this, the whole kind of geographical symbolism of Narnia is, is built about uh, kind of a th three layers. In, in the middle, you've got the perfect m medium. But to the north of Narnia, you've got the, the place where the white witch comes from, the northern witches. But to the south of Narnia, you've got this place called Calaman, where the people are of a darker skin. So to the north, you have the white witch. To the south, you have the dark Calamines. And this is a colour scheme that goes back to Lewis's first allegory that he wrote after his Christian conversion, the Pilgrim's Regress, where this allegorical kind of topography is used even more explicitly. And there you have to the north, you have the pale men, who are who are flawed by their over reliance upon the head, and to the south you have the the the, um, the little brown girls and the dark fetid black salt marsh, um, where the people who live there are are prey to other kinds of errors, an excess of sensuality, an excess of appetite. So this is the um, this is the, s the symbolic scheme that Lewis is drawing upon, and it, I think it's foolish to. I'm not, I'm not accusing law of being a fool, but it's um, it's it's unwise to to concentrate too much on the, you know, the depictions of these dark calamines and their errors without focusing also on the the errors of the white witch to the north. It's this a colour scheme which doesn't have very much actually to do with with literal race. That's so that's the first thing. And the other thing is that Lewis is always keen to find exceptions to general rules. And so although the Calamines are in general a cruel race, uh, sensual and prone to, <laughs> you know, eating garlic and onions and all these regrettable practices, um, you know, there are at least two Calamines that he gives us who are the epitome of nobility and, and you know, all the good characters. So there's this character called Emeth in The Last Battle. Emeth is a name which means faithfulness or truth or permanence. And he's a Calamine. Um, He's not damned just because he's got a dark skin, by no means. And then there's this other character called Aravis in The Horse and His Boy. Um, she's she's a Calamine girl, and she's presumably dark-skinned, and she ends up marrying a Narnian, a white-skinned Narnian, which is a very forward-thinking example of kind of interracial marriage in Narnia. Um, so you can hardly put that down to racism. I, I, interesting. I mean, without dwelling too much longer on this, Laura, I mean, 
when you did come across as an adult these more nuanced realizations that of, of the various flaws as you put it in in narnia did did that again detract from the book on top of the the christian symbolism that had put you off it in the first place well it 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 annoys me i mean i i you know when i see it i kind of go uh, you know but uh, on the other hand you know it it is kind it is in a way, in this sort of weird realm of, of, of a fantasy world where how people look, you know, like the beautiful, the good people are beautiful and the evil people are ugly. I mean, there is this kind of fairy tale aspect to it that, that, um, that in the, in, in the same way that there's like the, I have to say though that the the idea that the the northern pale people and the southern dark people map to like the head and the body is also as as Roland Barth wrote in SC sort of maps to the sort of European idea that um, that to the south the darker people are you know more just physical and 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 uh, prone to sensuality and it it, it, it even that idea even that sort of idea of a color spectrum uh, in which the dark is associated with the the, the sensual has this history that in in western society of 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 racial stereotyping so it's it you can't even really separate that from from this, but it's not a huge element to me in the books. I mean, it's really only a big issue in um, the horse and his boy, and to a lesser degree, the last battle. And so, you know, I just kind of go, "Oh, there's that mm. again." In the same way that I that that I might uh, feel. I mean, it's certainly not as objectionable as the racism in, say, Gone with the Wind, um, a book which I, I basically couldn't really enjoy because of the 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 racial depictions in that but that claims to represent the real world which is not what lewis is doing right i mean i won't sort of go go on too long but the, the, there are other aspects you know which you talk of uh, and in particular it might be worth touching on the fact that lewis has come under criticism from uh, for instance a modern children's writer philip pullman who obviously um has written a trilogy which some might say is almost <laughs> the counterpoint to the Nani stories in as much as it sort of presents an atheist view of, of, of understanding through a kind of a fantasy novel. But, um, I mean, he's been very critical of Lewis uh, for sort of, as he sees it, kind of the way he treats Susan in particular in The Last Battle, um, that she had somehow lost her link with Narnia, her spirituality, if you like, because of um, she got too concerned with lipstick and glossy magazines and things uh, and and it, it, it's it's been suggested you know that you know he's not being realistic about just the, the way that you know teenagers develop he was kind of had a so, somewhat outmoded view of what childhood was really about perhaps i mean do, do you agree with that laura well i think that um it's not so much about childhood it's just that he was really uncomfortable with adult female sexuality he saw it as or he experienced it as being dangerous. And um, you see that with the White Witch and the Green Witch, who are both really beautiful and seductive, but also, um, you know, uh, power-mad and evil. And the lack of, of sort of sexual you know, women of, of reproductive age who are positive figures beyond the, the one care, one really fairly negligible princess character in... Um, the, in Dawn Treader. And with uh, Susan, even she does actually grow up in Narnia, and even there her sexuality is an issue because it attracts um, the this uh, evil Calamine prince to sort of try to uh, attack Narnia um, because she rejects him sexually. So I think that he just had a lot of ambivalence about sexuality and about women, and that this came out in 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 the books i mean are um, we forgetting though that these these are children's books it's not the kind of themes you'd necessarily explore that much in a, in children's literature well is it? what's funny it makes a funny comparison to tolkien whose books are sort of devoid of any kind of eroticism at all even though there are um adult women in them i mean i think that for i think that for lewis this discomfort because let's face it uh, fairy tales are full of sexuality even if it's not overt i mean they're mostly about people getting married like 
Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty or um, you know any number of these princesses that whose princes are pursuing them. Mm. But um, but um, I think that you know it was really real to him. I mean, one of the things that sort of endears him to me is that he was clearly a person of strong sensual impulses on on every level. However much. The, the the maybe the erotic might have troubled him you know he loved food and drink and he wrote about the physical world in this fantastically you know sort of delicious rich sensual way and that in a way i one of the things that susanna clark another writer that i interviewed um uh, she said to me one, it was that she felt like for him these women were so powerful because they were so attractive you know that 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 um that that he was drawn to them and troubled by the lack of of uh, power that that attraction, uh, lack of control that that attraction um, indicated to him. And so, in a way, that was, you know, that was a, a, a an emblem of the, the 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 incredible allure of evil. Um, so, you know, in a way, you know. Yes, I, I see these depictions of, of, of women in his books as being, um, you know, uh, indicative of, of this discomfort that he had, but it was mm. partly because the physical side of life had so much attraction to him, and I identify with that. <laughs> so, so I say, oh, yeah, I can, see, I can see what you mean. I can see why this, this, this bothered you. And... Um, and but you know the reality is that it's there. I mean, again, it doesn't ruin the books for me, but it's nevertheless that discomfort is clearly there. Are we getting a bit too Freudian here, Michael? Do you, do do you see as much of a kind of an issue here as as Laura obviously does? Uh, well, I like Lewis. I'm a man, so I share the limitations of his sex, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I f- I don't find so much of a problem here actually as I as I. I, as I concede that there could legitimately be said to be with race, with respect to race, because um, I, I think I think there are examples on both sides. I mean, Laura said earlier that you know there there are stereotypes at work in Narnia, and, and ugly people are bad, and beautiful people are good. But you know, we've we've found also that beautiful people can be bad. You know, and that's one of the problems of the of the of the beautiful but seductive enchantress. Um, Lewis said in his essay on Tasso that it has almost disappeared from the modern imagination, and that's one of the reasons why he, he brings them brings them back with Jadis and the White Witch, who are incredibly beautiful and yet also deeply evil. But then you find on the other side, I of the think pic- that, that that Lewis didn't obviously read very many hard boiled detective novels or see much <laughs> film noir if he well, thinks that the femme fatale has been well, from yeah, I, culture. I agree. Uh, it, it is it does seem to be overstated, but but nonetheless. Yes, I mean, on the other side of the picture, you have beautiful women in Narnia who are good. Uh, so you have the star's daughter, for instance, in the Dawn Treader, and Edmund says to her, you know, you look beautiful, but that you might be a witch, just as this banquet spread before us on this table looks delicious, and yet it might be poisoned, it might be enchanted. How can we know? And she says in the reply, you can only taste and see, or not. Um and there's plenty of good, sec- good, healthy sexuality in Narnia too. I mean, there are lots of Frank and Helen in the magician's nephew get married and become the father and mother of kings and queens. And and I mean, it's not just Susan who attracts the attentions of princes. It's Lucy too. At the end of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the princes of those parts desired her to be their queen, and she's not frowned upon for that. And at the end of the Last Battle, there's clearly a budding romance going on between Lucy and. Uh, and King Tyrion, uh, subtly evoked, I think. Um, I, I think, you know, there, there's good sexuality and there's bad sexuality in Narnia, just as there is in real life, and I, I find that fairly kind of realistic. You're listening to Unbelievable, and over the summer we're airing a few classic replays of the show. Today's from 2009 features Michael Ward and Laura Miller, A Skeptic's Journey in Narnia, and we'll be back with part three very soon. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. Hello. 
Hello and welcome back to the final part of Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley and uh, on the show this week we're airing, re-airing a classic discussion from 2009, Michael Ward and Laura Miller. But uh, still to come this evening here on Premier Christian Radio, the profile, Sam Robertson of the Glasgow Prophetic Centre and Janet Davey MP, who's Shadow Minister for Faith, Women and Equalities, will both feature on the profile this evening and of course uh, you can hear it wherever you are in the world at any time of the day or night via its own podcast you're looking for the profile from premier wherever you get your podcasts from and still to come in today's show uh, we'll have a little bit of your feedback to last week's john lennox fest and some other recent shows as well but right now here's the final part of michael ward and laura miller talking about laura's relationship with the children's stories of narnia as an adult skeptic Unbelievable with Justin Briley. Well, um, just as we start to wrap things up, um, I mean, it's probably worth pointing out, Laura, uh, you, you really, Lewis, for you, the best of Lewis was contained in Narnia because you never really were attracted by his apologetics stuff. Um, I mean, y- you, you never really engaged with the Christian Lewis, did you? Um, I have I've I've read some of uh, his uh, his apologetics, um, but I would qualify that by saying that I also really really love his literary criticism, and I've uh, I've read um, pretty much all of that, and um, and and that was a, a fabulous discovery for me in researching this book. I mean, some of it I'd read before. But I managed to find a copy of Allegory of Love and um, the the volume of the Oxford History of English Literature that he wrote and just bury myself in those. And, he, you know, since I am a literary critic myself, his, his you know, very um, uh, palpable, very uh, straightforward, um, learned but not pretentious appreciation of books was just the great treat for me in in working on this book just mm. to engage with that over and over again and um and I feel like I learned a great deal about how to read from 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 him so in a way I I almost have come to like his criticism as almost as much as Narnia it will never have the same place in my life sure. but I see the Narnia books more as an extension of his literary self than of his religious self, because obviously his the literary aspect of them is what I ultimate what ultimately was implanted in me, mm. um, and what grew and blossomed, um, so that so that I was just delighted to discover that I I, I found so many um, resonances between my own experiences and and, and his when I uh, managed to sort of really dig into his literary criticism. Mm. Uh, uh, Michael, I imagine you've probably just about read everything there is to read that lewis wrote um and he was prodigious he was, yeah. i mean not only with books but letters mm. uh, etc but i mean uh, you've said before as well um in many ways the, the apologetics the children's literature the, the novels were just a sideline for mm. lewis uh, his main work was the academic stuff and and um in many ways, that that was kind of getting into that was what led you to your discovery about right. about the Narnia novels. That's right. When, um, yeah, um, but I, I would want to agree with what Laura just said about the the kind of generosity and the hu- humaneness and the learnedness of Lewis's academic writings. They're they're really r- rich and rewarding, especially a book like An Experiment in Criticism. Which, uh, I is, love that book. It's a, yeah. such a ripe and genial, relaxed book, I think, about w- what makes a good book good and what, what makes a good reader a good reader. And one of the things I particularly appreciate it, about that book, and I think it ties in with, with what Laura's perspective is um, on Narnia, Lewis says that um, you know he has no time for literary critics who have no conception of the purely literary good. Um, F. R. Leavis was his great antagonist in this respect. And he, he thought that Leavis, who was a professor at Cambridge, he th- Leavis, according to Lewis, um, you know, he thought that unless a book chimed precisely with what you believed about, you know, the ethically and the morally desirable, 
that that book was worthless, and that reduced the canon of, children, of English literature to about five acceptable <laughs> books. Uh, Lewis thought this was ridiculous, and you, you can you can read uh, you know D. H. Lawrence is one of his examples, and think that the morality of Lawrence's vision is a bit muddled or even pernicious, but you can still appreciate Sons and Lovers or, or even Lady Chatterley's Lover for um, you know for literary reasons. So you don't need to accept everything that an author puts into his books. Um, there, there are other things to be got out of reading. And that's one of the th- things I so appreciate about Laura's take on Narnia, that she finds quite a lot in Narnia which she, which she doesn't particularly approve of or accept. Um, and I find a, 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 a number of things, probably a, a, fewer, a smaller number of things, that I also don't accept. And yet you can repeatedly go back to these books and, and enjoy them as stories. And mm. that's... that's um, I think why they will survive because they're good literature, regardless. Well, of and and I think that it, it 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 it's an excellent analogy to a human being. I mean, every human being mm. has flaws, um, but they have an innate value, yes. and I think that's the 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 quality of literature that Lewis was speaking to. Was it's really? I mean, I know he didn't think highly of humanists, but it is a humanist argument. If you say, you know. The literature has value in and of itself, yes. apart from what it can teach you or mm. how it's supposed to change you. You mm. know, I mean, it's not a tool; it's not a means to an end. It's an end in itself, yeah. and um, and that is the, the the thing that you know I, as a humanist, really respond to in him as a literary critic because that is in everything that he writes about books mm, i mean mm. that value is is there that that it is that there's something so precious because it is so human about literature and 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 that is an understanding that really i think you do have to have an adult sensibility to achieve you know it's not that you have to agree with everything mm. it's not that you have to absolutely believe in it the way mm. that a child does it's that you you just have an appreciation for its innate value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you both for joining me. It's been a wonderful uh, thing to, to have you both on the programme today. And uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, the usual way of doing it, unbelievable at premier.org.uk. For more conversations between Christians and sceptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.